Joining us now, uh, she's been the head coach at Wisconsin, now uh, entering since two, the fall of 2010. She's been uh, the head coach there, of course, now in her 11th season. I speak of Yvette Healy back with us here on In the Circle. Uh, coach, how you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Excited. It's an exciting time of year to, to start talking softball. Has it feel like it's been a decade there in Wisconsin for you, or is it like blown by fast? It has gone extremely fast, but you know, I do have young daughters. So I think when you have kids, they help you see that passage of time because I don't know, it's been a blink of an eye, but uh, my second daughter Maeve was born here and she turned nine and will be 10 this summer. So she is a, a Madison girl. That's tremendous. It's been, uh, it's been a big culture there. You've had to turn this program to success and being a postseason program and, and Olympians. And one in particular, in Kelsey Harshman, this past uh, summer in the Summer Olympics, part of Team Canada. She was the first ever three-time All Big Ten performer for in Wisconsin softball history, and she's making more history. She uh, leads a part of Team Canada's bronze medal. What was it like following her path and her journey to get to the Olympics, which obviously was a unique uh, journey with everything that has been going on the last couple of years. It, it was such a fun thing. You know, Wisconsin's kind of known for pumping out a lot of pro players and a lot of international players. And, and Canada is a, you know, a country that Wisconsin knows well being up north. So we've had a lot of great hockey players um, represent and go on. But to do it with softball was just such a cool thing for our staff. And uh, to recruit KJ out of um, Arizona and see her has this little, little tiny slapper and grow into, you know, a, a real triple threat and um, grind in her game and, and be on staff for us as a volunteer. It, it's just a, a neat thing. And there is so much pride in, at Wisconsin following Kelsey. What did you see in her when you were recruiting her and, and, and that, that you felt would, you know, she would be a big impact on your program? And did you ever imagine that she would turn into the player that she did? You know, uh, she, I think she exceeded everyone's expectations. We thought she was a big deal. You know, we went after her hard. She was just an elite leadoff hitter in the middle, but she could get on base. And, you know, that was one thing. If you look at her Big Ten stats, which are so fun that, you know, she's playing while these elite players are, are playing in our conference. And she's leading the conference and vying for most walks you know, fighting with Sierra Romero, who uh, those were all intentional to her. And KJ as a leadoff kid just had this tremendous eye so she could get on base. Um, but when she started to hit too, she really took her game to another level. And that's hard. If you're a kid that just gets on base at will and can, can knock out singles, you know, it, that it's kind of boring to make them take a chance and go for it. She's a special player that she took that dip almost to, um, add the power to her game and a lot of people don't don't have the stomach or the guts to to maybe not hit 500 or be on base as much to to work on that extra base hit potential and she she knew the team needed it and you know it made her into an olympian an olympia what was it like watch you know getting up at weird hours to watch team canada play and then in particular that bronze medal game where they beat Mexico and because I'm sure you knew and talking to her, this was a big deal for them to try to get a medal. The Canada had never won a, a medal in the Olympics in softball. There was a high expectations with that roster, super competitive. I know they trained in Florida just to make the team as a challenge. What was that like watching those games in the hour and unique hours like they were? Yeah, I, you know, I, I wish we were there. That's the one part, you know, before the world shut down for COVID, we were planning kind of one of those trips of a lifetime. And I was going to take my daughters to, to go make that, you know, that giant trip and go watch the Olympics. So, um, you know, I know we wish there were fans in the stands, but the fact that they got it together and did play was such a big deal. And we were recruiting in California. So time was already all, all off, but my staff and I were out there and, and pulling up the iPad and, you know, watching those late night games and trying to do things all at once. But it was, it was a thrill getting to watch them. And, and simultaneously you're following the USA and it, what a cool time for softball over the summer. What does her being in the biggest stage there in the Olympics uh, mean for your program? Uh, you know, because I'm sure you talk to recruits, you bring it up to your players, even your current roster, you bring it. I'm sure this has been a conversation. Her being in that stage, what does it mean to your program? 
Absolutely. I think it, it brings it down to earth for them. You know, I think when you meet someone and you've trained and you've been coached by KJ or you were a teammate and, you know, went to the NCAA tournament with her, now they see her become an Olympian and it makes it accessible. You know, I think it, the dreams open up that then you have other great players on your team that they aspire to do it and they know someone who's done it. It's, you know, KJ came back, we did an alumni practice and the team was honored on the field um, this fall. The softball team raised more money from a, a, a alumni donation challenge than any other sport at Wisconsin. So it was such a cool thing to see them honored and the alums meeting the current players. But, you know, a lot of them were holding that medal and you could tell that that it's a goal and a dream for a lot of the young players. And, you know, it, it just makes it a chance for them. What's next for her? Uh, you mentioned she was on your staff at one point. Uh, what does she want to do now? Does she want to continue to play? Is she gonna? Has she thought about what's next for her? Because that's always the unique challenge for an Olympian is like you 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 train for this one moment, and now it's done. It's like okay, now what? Yeah, I think she'll keep playing because she's at such an elite level, and she trained, and she's in such great shape. Um, so that AU sports was a tremendous, and I know she's going to keep doing international play, and you know hopefully keep participating in that. I think she's, she knows she's in the best shape of her life. She knows she's never been stronger. So she's going to ride it out. And, you know, I think Matt, her, her new husband's just going to have to wait a little bit for the family to, to get going, but she is doing some coaching in Arizona as well. And, you know, I, I hope she becomes a college coach. We've talked about it and I think she just knows so much. So we're really hoping that she, uh, she looks into that and, and becomes that next round of we've had some great players go on to keep coaching and giving back to the game. And, and I think she's got that in her heart. Yeah. You've got a good coaching tree developing there. We've talked about that before when you've been on, uh, you know, whether it be former players or people you, you know, you've coached with, uh, you know, I mean, Tracy Addix Zins, who I just spoke to recently, the DePaul head coach, obviously praised you a lot in helping her being now the head coach at DePaul and, and kind of advice you've given her. What, where does that come from you helping out other people and, and really helping them, in that next phase, either either post playing career or or just getting involved in the sport. Well, I think you know I I got to play the mid major, so I graduated from DePaul. And when you do cool things at a small school, it kind of changes your worldview. So getting to be a class there at a mid major that went to the World Series for the first time, it you realize what a blessing it is that you just are fortunate that it changes your view on life of like, well, what's not possible? If you could do this from a small school and you know, in the middle of the city, and that's a big part of coaching what, that I love of just it opens young women's eyes that anything's possible. And so I think the ones that play for us and with us and coach with us, they know that's a big part of my motivation of just this, this sport can change your life and it opens doors and it just kind of opens your mind that, limits aren't there. And so um, to see them go on and coach, I think there's a, a lot of gratitude, uh, a lot of need to give back because it, we're in this sport because it's done so much and we love it and want to grow it. And it's fun to have like, like-minded and like-hearted women that you've coached with and that you've coached continue to want to give back and grow it. How competitive is your staff? I mean, you got like, you were a former <laughs> player, you got, you know, Danielle Zimkowitz, who's definitely super competitive in talking to her in the past and Kirsten, obviously, I mean, well, that's a pretty competitive staff coach there. It is, it is. And now we've got Steph Lombardo, one of our former players as our volunteer assistant. And she was a GA last year and, and her team went to the NCAA tournament uh, at Eastern Kentucky being a graduate assistant. So she's competitive, all of us lefties. So that's kind of funny whenever we're messing around doing drills or, or hitting, we, some of us have a little different game. You know, Coach Verdon was quite the power hitter lefty uh, when she was at DePaul and Coach Zimkowitz, you know, was a speed kid that became a power kid um, when she played pro for the Bandits. And, and Steph Lombardo is known for some of Wisconsin's most famous walk-off hits that we've ever had in the, in the program. So yeah, it, it gets competitive. It's, it's funny, even if we're playing dominoes or, you know, doing the, the easiest thing, people are out for blood. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, I'm sure it's competitive on the softball field, but I, I can see you all being pretty competitive outside the softball field, right? Like there's probably some, whether it be tennis or whatever you guys decide to play, maybe card games, it, it probably is pretty competitive in general. 
Yeah, you should see them golfing. And they can, they can hit the ball of like, that is a group that, you know, I might score better than all of them because I've got the strategy that I know how to manage, but they, that's three women that are just going to go for it for the longest drive. And they're funny. Yeah, it's, it's a fun group. And you've got a really diverse experience and perspective, but people that love the game. And so I just feel so fortunate as a coach to, to have that staff put together of some just tremendous ball players that know a lot, but they just love the players and, and they love to win. And can relate to the players, right? They've uh, all of you have been through every scenario that a player has gone is going through. Uh, that has to be huge too to have that connection, which is so important. It is, it is that those role models, but those people that you know, Steph Lombardo shares. Here's what it feels like to strike out three times and then hit a walk off home run, you know. And they they want to hear that uh, reality of it's not easy. It's not always easy. And to have someone that you coached on staff is, is tremendous, but then all Americans from different schools that, that played at the highest level and played pro, um, they we're really fortunate that they pull from some of their best friends, you know, coach Z is funny. She'll put, she'll pull Monica up and, and put Monica Abbott on the phone on speaker, you know, and, and be asking her questions. And so when you've got women that are so entrenched in the sport, they have friends and uh, people that they can tap into and resources. And that's, that's a cool part of softball. That's a pretty good deal, by the way, where you could just dial up Monica Abbott on a moment's notice and just, you know, that's not <laughs> bad. That's good. That's a good speed dial list there. That's a good speed. Dial. I'd have to say though, uh, coach, coach Z uses that phone call more probably for FaceTiming her, you know, when we're, we're snowboarding wearing her USA jersey than to get actual softball advice. It's probably funnier than than most people think. But yeah, they they are friends with some really impressive women that have done things at a really high level. And, um, you know, our team is fortunate to get to hear those stories about the pro league, about, you know, playing at different schools, about just succeeding at the highest level. And they want to be all Americans at Wisconsin, all these women. And, you know, we're trying to help them know that it's about winning the big 10 more than just those individual honors and awards. And, but they're learning from some of the best. No doubt about that. Uh, let's talk about your group. You had a young team last year, which is always a, a unique challenge in a normal year, but you didn't have anything but a normal year. You had a, Obviously, with the COVID and the protocols, you had a conference-only schedule uh, plus protocols. What was that like? What did you learn about your group uh, being so young? It's, it, that was a challenge for everybody, whether it's veterans or youth, but you had a young team. So what was that like, and what did you learn from last year? Yeah, it, you know, it was humbling. It's humbling to not get, get to match up as a Power 5 school with other conferences, with other teams regionally. Um, so I think, first and foremost, it was a, a lesson in um, patience, humility, you know, working the process. I think as coaches, we preach those things all the time. And then we really had to uh, back up our talk and do that as coaches because you all of a sudden were facing things that felt unfair. And, you know, you were navigating uh, uncomfortable situations. We tell our team all the time, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And then when something gets thrown at us and you get shut down or you're on a roll and then you don't get to keep playing. Um, you know, it was good that we personally got, got tested to see how you would deal with adversity. Um, but I think we learned so much and you come off of a year where you lost a lot and maybe you didn't have as many advantages or you felt like you were handcuffed. I think the opportunity is just so ripe right now that it, we see it that way of, you know, just, being able to have fans again, being able to play other schools. The team is so excited for those first couple of weekends just to get to match up with, you know, you play your own conference and it's almost like scrimmaging that you know them so much and it's fun and it's great, but you can't wait to see how you match up with the ACC and the SEC and, and go after those other schools and conferences. So I think there's even more excitement going into those first couple of weeks of the season. Yeah, we, uh, we just had, we had recently on uh, Michelle Gascoigne, the assistant at Northwestern, and she admitted like, Last year, really, she now appreciates more the, even the midweek games. You know, the quality competition you would get on a midweek non-conference game leading into a Big Ten and the fact that, and the impact of a Big Ten tournament. You didn't have a Big Ten tournament. So, you know, they felt they were kind of playing catch-up all year. Did you feel that way? And do you now, you know, there's certain things maybe you appreciate now or maybe your players appreciate more now than maybe they did, a, say, a year or so ago? Oh, sure. I think in, and just the, just getting to travel in the tournaments and getting a full schedule. I think everybody appreciates that. 
Um, but our juniors are hungry to experience a postseason. You know, their freshman year, there was no postseason. Their sophomore year, it was really hard for our conference to get teams in. I think we've been a, a conference that is, is fighting for five or six and, and doing it really at a high clip. And then last year, you didn't see that. And so you've got some tremendous players. Like for us, um, Fiona Gerardo is a junior. And man, that kid is impressive. And she put up some numbers against a Big Ten only schedule. And she can hit RBIs and she can score runs and she plays defense. And, and she got no love. And that's okay. You know, her, that wasn't her time yet. But I think kids like that, uh, and they haven't gotten to play in the postseason. So what a talented Midwest kid that you know, really hasn't had the upside of, of the career she could have yet, just by virtue of the, the, what's been around and, and you know, the, the hand she was dealt. So I just can't wait for players like that to experience the postseason, see what it's like to represent the conference and, um, you know, get some big ranked wins. And she, there's just so much that she hasn't seen. I think, I think the year is going to blow her mind. <laughs> well, and you're well, one of the programs that always plays a tough non-conference schedule and I feel like that's kind of what hurt, you know, the league as a whole last year is not having that resume of the non-conference probably cost you the league one or two bids fairly or not with the committee. That's a whole different conversation, <laughs> but, 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 but that, right. I mean, that's part of it is you also use that non-conference to get your players ready for conference too. Right. And, and to learn how to win, you know, you're, you're trying to challenge them on some parts, but then, you know, put together some W's and play enough games. And if you're a young player, they're trying to figure out how good they are. But the pitching in our conference was tremendous last year. It really was good. And I don't think people from the outside know, but, um, you know, you were facing 65 with the changeup, you know, 65 plus with the changeup uh, and, and some good movement every, every weekend. And so, you know, we knew how good Illinois was, we knew how good Iowa was, we knew how good Indiana was. And, and you saw some of those teams not getting to continue to play and they were dog fights. And so, um, you know, I, I'm excited for the whole, I think there's a lot of people are, are hungry and have a lot to prove, but I, I have a lot of pride coming from the Midwest and growing up in Chicago and I have a lot of pride for the big 10. So I just think, I think this is a year to really have a great bounce back and see the, the conference come roaring back. You mentioned Fiona, obviously, 324 uh, on the year to lead your team. Talk about her and then other players on your offense you're going to depend on this year. Right. You look at her and that's and that's a you know, you're only playing power five schools too. that to put up those numbers only against that schedule. I, I think she's pretty special. And we graduated a lot. So then you're a young kid that's not supported by the hitters. So uh, we've got high hopes for her. Um, Christana Angelopoulos is a catcher, a big lefty power kid, had some, you know, big memorable home runs last year. She had a, a grand slam at Northwestern, you know, off the bench, came in and, you know, hit the building. And But she's a kid with power that, that played this summer in that Florida Gulf Coast League and um, has really grown. She's going to be fun to see. Any, anytime you put a big lefty in there, which Steph Lombardo, our volunteer assistant, will tell you, they're just tough to throw to. Um, so we're excited about her. Maddie Schwartz on the mound, man, she was great last year. And, you know, she put up 11 wins and I don't think anybody even noticed how good she was and the caliber of games she threw. And so she threw great this fall too. We played a tough schedule and, you know, in the fall, not everybody's competitive or, or is, is going for the W, but <clears throat> we certainly like to be competitive all the time. And, uh, but she threw great, you know, and so she got to face some tremendous hitters, you know, with, with Northwestern and Notre Dame and, and some other great programs and, and she's holding her own. So we've got high hopes for Maddie and she's a Minnesota gal and has family that went to Wisconsin. So she's just a great story that if you can get these local regional kids that love UW and have so much pride, like, like Maddie or Allie Miklish, who's a senior center fielder from the state, um, they, they really have another level to play because they're playing for a lot more than just just a win when they're representing their state. Sounds to me you like the leadership you've got here. You've got some leaders here you really trust and like here. Uh, Maddie Schwartz, you mentioned, and some of the seniors you talked about, right? Is that an accurate statement that you like the, the, the leadership you've got so far? I do. I do. And their heart's in the right place. And, and we're bringing Lauren Foster back. So Lauren Foster's a fifth year. We had no fifth years last year. That was kind of a, a decision of the um, of our institution that we wouldn't bring fifth years back. So that was a hard year. But this year now with, you know, 
hopefully things being in a better place, um, we're, we're able to do it. And so Lauren Foster is a fifth year senior shortstop um, and just such a, a big hearted kid who's been in the big moments. And she's the kid who, who caught the last ground ball when we beat Oklahoma at their place. She's the kid that caught the last ground ball when we beat Texas. You know, so she's been in those clutch moments that a young player, they might get rattled, <laughs> you know, and she, and she did it at a young age and was able to close out some tough games. It, every coach in the country will tell you if you're about to win a uh, ranked game on the road, it's going to be tough if the last ball is a grounder. And <laughs> for her to be a shortstop that was able to convert and close out those games is, was pretty cool to see. So we've got we've got some excitement with Lauren Foster being back, too. It's experience. It's those intangibles that you can't duplicate in practice, right? It's that experience. It's so critical to have on a roster that brings those intangibles. It is. It is. And their love for each other. I think that, you know, everybody's been through a lot, but Jolie Fish is a, a senior who she was injured um, last year, but just has a big heart and has had some big moments for us scoring runs in big games and she's able to put the ball over the fence and, you know, had some big hits and we've stolen a couple ranked wins against ASU at their place. She had a grand slam as a youngster. And so we're excited to get, you know, players like that back in the lineup that have power and know how to do it against great teams too. Yeah. Last year you had a uh, Megan Donahue led you at six homers, 25 RBIs, 287 average Peyton Bannon, 291. What does those two bring? Well, uh, Megan Donahue, what a cool story that she's a Wisconsin kid. You know, and when you have players that are are walk on scholars, walk on players like Megan Donahue that become scholarship kids, that's what kind of the Wisconsin dreams all about. And so to put up numbers like that and, and crush and, and hit in games like the Nebraska and the Northwestern series when she was just pounding balls. Um, you know, we have some tremendous walk ons that become scholarship kids and she's just one more in the list of players that I think that's why the state's so excited and they fill the stands. Because all those little kids know, like, this happens, and it happens in our program. Uh, Peyton Bannon's a Chicago kid who, gosh, she is tremendously athletic. So she did great, you know, added a little power to her game. But she's always been a great defender that runs well. And then she just lit it up offensively last year, too. So, and she's a run scorer. Like, you see her run the bases. And, and we love players that are athletic and can run. And so she's, she's our kind of kid from that standpoint that you want to pressure the defense watch Peyton Bannon run and, and she's going to hurry up your throw. <laughs> you mentioned those kids in the Midwest. It's fun. I talked to big 10 coaches and even other programs in the Midwest. They always talk about how pivotal it is recruiting in the Midwest talent. Cause obviously a lot of attention towards Florida and California and in Texas, but the Midwest has a ton of talent. Why is that somebody who's up there has played up there, you know, knows that area as well as anybody. What is it about the Midwest that produces so much talent? You know, I, I think there's a toughness. I'm from the Chicagoland area. And, you know, we had a lot of Midwest kids in, in that DePaul program that I was able to play in and, and coach at. And I learned a lot from Coach Lenti, you know, to play under a Hall of Fame coach that makes it about being competitive. You know, find kids that refuse to lose, that want it, that are hungry, that, you know, are that care and are going to, you know, die before you can get them off the field, that play hard. Um, so that mentality is really translated and it fits perfectly here when coach Alvarez uh, hired me and, you know, him being a football coach and, and our, then becoming our AD, he knew how much you needed those tough kids, but we do have some great talent all over the country, like Kelsey Jenkins. And so you've got to pepper in those, those, those other players, you know, your Arizona and California and, and warm weather kids. We've got Ava Justman, a lefty pitcher um, from California, and she's she's fun. She's competitive. She's so you you do have to recruit nationally, but your Midwest kids that grow up and this is their dream school. It's something about when they march out there and, and put the W on, and this is what they always wanted to do, and this is where they always wanted to be. They play with this level of heart that it's it's pretty fun to coach. You mentioned obviously Maddie Schwartz leading your pitching staff and what she's done. Talk about the rest of their pitching staff and how you uh, expect from them and helping uh, Maddie out. Because usually when you've been in a tournament teams, you've usually have multiple arms that you can go to. Oh, and and those first two tournaments, I don't know if you saw our schedule, but I mean they're they're monsters right out of the gate. That you know opening weekend we'll see three super regional teams matching up with Kentucky on Thursday night to kick off the season you know, a little early and we've got Mizzou and, and you've got Virginia Tech that weekend. And 
um, you know, the second weekend you've got your Clemson and UCLA and Auburn and Notre Dame, and it, it just doesn't stop. So we need more than one arm, certainly. Um, Ava Justman's a, a lefty that we're excited about, you know, coach Verdon is a left-handed pitcher, all American. And so if you've got a, a lefty pitching coach, like, like Michelle Gascoigne, and you know, if you get those lefties, it's even more fun to coach because they've having a left-handed pitching coach is such an elite thing at this level. Um, so Ava will help us certainly. Um, they're young, you know, we've got her, you've got Tessa Magnanimo, who's a, another California kid who played for Marty Tyson and, um, you've got, uh, Gabby Salo coming back from injury. She, uh, it, she's a chucker. She's a hard thrower. She's a kid from Escanaba, Mich Michigan. So she's from the UP. So she matches our builds. She'll be fun to see coming back because she's got a big heart. Um, and then Abby Herbst is a hitter and also a pitcher. And so, you know, we're going to have a lot of, a lot of arms to kind of give you a different look. And I think that'll help us as we're trying to mastermind how to how to steal a couple big wins early on. Who are some of the new faces in the position areas, defensively and even offensively, the new faces that uh, could you think will contribute and Badger fans will certainly uh, be, need to keep a look, uh, an eye out on? Yeah, I mean, they all feel new because <laughs> they are so young. Yeah. So it's funny, even though sophomores and juniors, I feel like a lot of people don't know, um, don't know who they are, but Brooke Huffles, a freshman that's been doing some really good things for us. Um, she's physical. She she's an infielder who can do anything, but she'll run through a wall. And so when you see kids that are strong and physical, that are really agile too, um, it reminds me of Michelle Mueller who played here. You know, we won the Big Ten back in 2013. That Michelle was a physical kid that she could put it over the fence, but she could steal a base, and and you did not want to cover the base when she was running. And I think Brooke Huffle looks like that. That. Um, she's a fun kid to watch that she's just so dang strong and competitive. Um, so she's doing great. Ellie Hubbard's a freshman out of the Chicagoland area, big lefty hitter, second baseman that um, she's a, a basketball player and she's just a funny, athletic, competitive kid. And so those are some new faces that have been doing some really great things that we're excited to see, you know, see how they match up. But for us, just getting some of those old faces back, um, you know, with Jolie Fish getting back into the, the mix, um, we're excited. You, what is it about? I'm call, I, I always call you all like catcher you. You always produce great catchers. I feel like, <laughs> if, what is it about? I mean, what is, I mean, obviously it's recruiting, you bring great talented players, but all the catchers you always have seem to produce not only for your program, but then after they leave your program and play professionally oh or internationally, it seems like. That's nice of you to say. Yeah, Chloe Miller was was a great one for us that she was a big lefty out of Iowa. And, and we saw her playing multiple sports, you know, with Iowa not getting to play summer ball. Um, and she became an All-American and just a competitive kid. And, and we we actually really like catchers that are shortstops, too. So Coach Z, every time she comes back recruiting, she's got a bunch of kids that catch and play shortstop, which is so rare. But dang, if you're not an athlete and if you just happen to hit left handed, too man, you're going to be a, a bear. And so uh, we're excited about Kristana like that. But, you know, she she got to meet Chloe Miller this summer or this fall when Chloe came back for some alumni stuff. And to see those two twin towers stand next to each other, um, you know, she just wanted to learn from her and, and, and ask her questions. But we're, we're excited behind the plate. And Coach Z does a tremendous job of studying the game. You know, we're just right here looking at drills and she's at the the – the softball convention and she's at the baseball convention. So she's got drills on drills for picking and, you know, converting off of one knee and, and seeing how we can get strikes called. And, you know, they, they got to work hard if they're going to catch for us. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Chloe Miller is one of my favorite, probably my favorite player you've had to this date. I mean, she was awesome to watch. Like, I remember that, you know, the first time, like, you know, the year after she obviously moved on, you know, graduated, it was kind of weird seeing your team, like, where's Chloe? I'm, I'm sure you felt the same way at she, first, so that's unbelievable. What, how's she doing? She is doing great. She is just a funny kid. And that, you know, we've been blessed with some big personalities that it's, it's just amazing of how good of players they are, but just how funny. And she was, she was fun to coach that she would dish it out. And she was roommates with Lauren Carlini. So our women's volleyball team won the national championship this year and, and they were good when Chloe was here and, and had the number one player in the country and Lauren Carlini. So the fact that those two are roommates, wow. I mean, that's a match. Like you just love that as the coach of just, you guys just talk the game, talk about competing. And, you know, Chloe's gone and done some, uh, 
weight room stuff and, and working on her master's. And now she's doing some kinesiology and she's doing some athletic training. So she's, she's working on her master's and, but she's one, when she comes in town, you want to, you want to spend time with her because she's, you know, we, they, we couldn't, we couldn't get to bed early. We, you know, we couldn't stay out late enough with those alums that they were just a hilarious group. By the way, that, that's a that's a Hall of Fame room uh, like dorm there. You just described that. Like that's got like so many stories. That's a pretty remarkable. They're one of the great volleyball players in softball. But that's a pretty that's a pretty darn good. That, wow, that's pretty top roommates there. That's pretty good story. That is. That is, and in our office right now, we share space with women's volleyball. We've got like a suite together. So that was so fun watching them currently make a run that we are buddies with their staff and we talk and get into breakdown film and, and see what they were doing. And, you know, they just happened to bring a couple swag bags back for us from the national championship and sharing with our staff. And so that's a, a cool thing about Wisconsin. You know, I saw that we just finished fourth in the Learfield Cup, um, you know, for the fall that you're at a school that people win. And it's fun to talk to women's soccer, talk to, you know, hockey and hockey and basketball. We were all at the game last night watching Johnny Davis, you know, Chase being national player of the year and um, being at a place where they win, you just learn so much from the other coaches and players. Yeah, you mentioned obviously volleyball, winning the national title in dramatic fashion against Nebraska in the most watched uh, a national championship ever uh, for NCAA volleyball there. They've been knocking on the door, Coach Shellfield and company. They've been knocking on that door, Final Four. They finally broke through. What was it like to to follow that? And and what is what's it like talking to Coach Sheffield and you know picking each other's brains, uh, if you will, in different sports? Because I would imagine them winning, seeing winning the national title is going to rub off on your players as fellow student athletes on campus, seeing one success. That's got to have a bit of a of a of a feed, right? Absolutely. I think everyone's seeing all the Big Ten championship rings too. They, they all told me, coach, we're going bigger. The next one we win, they didn't like that the last one wasn't big enough. And so, uh, I, you know, they see it. They see it from the other sports and they want it. And it's exciting and you learn. Um, but one of the things you see from Coach Sheffield and staff, he's got a tremendous staff that stayed together. You know, they are talented. Brittany winning, you know, National Assistant Coach of the Year. And I think we've got that kind of all-star staff here at Wisconsin to have Coach Burden on staff this long, to have Coach Zimkowitz, you know, those great programs, even in our conference, they've got that continuity. That's what Hutch has figured out, you know, holding her staff together and do that and, and Rhonda and, and, you know, you see these, these programs hold it. It's not, it's not a one man show. And so I've learned so much getting to work with Coach Burden and Coach Zimkowitz and seeing them, this is Coach Z's sixth year and Coach, Coach Verdon's seventh. And so for us three to be together for our sixth season, then, you know, my seventh with Coach Burden, there's been some fun wins with that crew. And, and volleyball certainly knows that it's a, a team effort. you got to have the best staff, not just the best players and the best head coach. Yeah, there's no doubt. And, and you mentioned that coaching being together for so long. I sense in talking to you and talking to other coaches in the Big Ten, there's a bond with an even all of you as coaches in the league. Not that there isn't in other leagues, but – there is that unique bond because you you're all together for a while and your staffs are together for a while. So you know each other and you all go through similar things like last year about playing only a, you know, conference only scheduled four games and how you dealing with that. And, and you all help each other out. Is that a fair assessment there? And I think I also feel like everybody there in the league is kind of, I don't know, I would say a chip on the shoulder, but certainly as you mentioned earlier, you're really excited and motivated to get uh, you all back on the field here and show and prove something maybe to the rest of the country. Absolutely. And I, you know, it's a, it's a conference that you can pick up the phone and people will answer your question. And I think that kind of mutual respect is phenomenal. You know, Hutch has been great to me that I grew up playing in the Midwest. So I played against her as an athlete and then to get into coaching, you know, she wants you to get everything you can for your program. And one of my first times bringing Wisconsin out to play them, she took me on a tour of their new facility and their training center. And, you know, I didn't understand. I, I thought she was trying to psych me out. I was like, why is she showing me all this great stuff? And, you know, we walk out and she's like, this is what you need to do at Wisconsin event. If you want it, you get them to build you stuff like this. And, you know, when we did build our indoor facility that's connected to the stadium and when we've gotten things, you think of players like, or coaches like Hutch that shared even how it's done from that level. And Rhonda's great at North, at Nebraska. You can pick up the phone and she will, if you're going through something hard, she'll answer questions and be really transparent and you know Shonda at Indiana loves softball 
you know, she's, she's probably listening to this podcast because I know she's a big fan of yours and listens to every podcast, but she's fun to bounce ideas off of and, and share resources. So you just get better when you can, when you can learn from some of the best in the business. I feel so fortunate to coach. It's, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm coaching this conference, honestly, growing up in the Midwest, it's just a funny thing that it's, it's wild to be, you know, shaking hands with some of these hall of fame coaches. Was that a dream of yours to coach in the Big Ten as you were, or was that was that even cross your mind as you were playing growing up in the Midwest? Was the Big Ten something that you just kind of because there is a lot of history in the Big Ten with all the universities from an academic standpoint and an athletic standpoint? Well, you know, not playing at a big school, you definitely have that chip on your shoulder. So I don't know if I grew up dreaming to do it. As soon as you you played a mid major, all you want to do is beat those teams. And so as a player, it was fun to try to take down the teams that didn't recruit you or that you, you know, you couldn't make their squad. And so it started like that, but you definitely have a respect for them. And then getting to coach and seeing, wow, what would it be like to coach with those facilities, with those academics, with uh, a full staff, a full scholarship amount? So that part is kind of a dream. But, you know, I, I thought I would get into marketing. I did. I was a sports marketing person. And then 9-11 hit and I kind of figured why not try to help people in their lives and, and stop just trying to make money. And so it was a fun wake up to kind of switch over to, I always thought softball would be a hobby and just something I love to do and do it on the side. Um, so I, I am kind of amazed that it's a career and it can support my family the way it has. You worked uh, with the Chicago White Sox uh, in the past. We've talked about that. What's been your reaction? We're seeing now women involved in baseball, getting hired in baseball. We got a, a first minor league baseball manager coming from softball. Rachel Folden is now in baseball. What's been your reaction? Somebody that was involved, you know, in baseball with the White Sox organization. Now you're seeing people involved from a managing standpoint and, you know, affecting on the field produ- uh, performance. Yeah, it's, that's such a, a cool thing for young women that they have more opportunities to give them chances on both sides of the sport. You see the value that men have added to the sport of softball too. And, you know, you, you don't want to keep it. You want to do it both ways. And so if it grows the sport, what a cool thing. I think it's such an opportunity for baseball. It's not just an opportunity for the women getting into it, but it's also for baseball to have some different perspective, a different view. Um, I love it. I love it. I was a Cubs fan growing up. So working for the White Sox was a little different for me, you know, switching sides of town. Um, but I learned so much and getting to be close to a sport that I love and growing it. Um, it's, you know, pro sports are, I, I honestly think it's one of the things that's helped get so many people uh, through these hard times in the country the last couple of years. Sports are, are keeping the world going. It was one of the first things to get back on track. And, um, you know, we've been grinding away here that, you know, we, the world is shut down a little bit, but it's, it's full steam ahead in the world of sports. And I'm glad for it. You see the mental health benefits to our young women and and my own kids that I feel like sports have been more of a a lifesaver than anything right now and I just hope this year we can with Wisconsin being a cold weather school and you know being an aspiring school I hope we can shed some good light into the world you know have some cool stories to tell that elevate people and make them happy because that's what we do every day no that's right well said well said on that and you mentioned obviously as a Chicago sports fan, you've had a pretty good run here with the Cubs winning the World Series. The White Sox made the playoffs last year with Tony La Russa. It looks like the Bulls are going to be pretty good. What's been what's it been like following them, having the White Sox? Because you obviously, especially the White Sox, because you had connections there working. What's oh, yeah. that been like following them? It's fun. It's fun. Actually, when I when I left the White Sox, I left to get into coaching uh, over the summer, and they won the World Series that year. So it <laughs> to be around championship programs is such a, a neat thing, you know, even here being, being around the Bucks and watching the Milwaukee Bucks make a run and, and the pride that the state has and how sports bring people together. Um, you know, it's, it's fun. We do get a hard time being Bears fans for how good the Packers are. Uh, but you, you gotta love just watching great sporting teams. I'm people say you can't cheer for both, but I, you know, I just love even, even being a Cubs fan. I always love the Sox too, that I, I don't love one and hate the other. And I'm the same way here um, up in Wisconsin. So I just, I'm a fan of great people that ball out and love the sport and respect it. And you just learn so much. So we're, we're in a, a great area to get to watch the Brewers and the Bucks and the Cubs. And, you know, it's, it's sports heaven up here. It might be cold, but it's sports heaven. <laughs> That's a great point. You bring up the Bucks winning the NBA title with Giannis. The Brewers make the playoffs. The Packers 
uh, here in the postseason or make a run for the Super Bowl. I know it's not as a Bears fan, you don't like that, but hey, it's the state of Wisconsin. That's, kind of, that's a good vibes, though, for the state of Wisconsin there. That's great. And we love it. We we live on a lake up here and we're a couple doors down from a little, you know, restaurant bar that everybody goes to for fish fry and sports are on constantly. So when you can, you know, walk on the lake and, and go watch a sports team and watch people cheer them on. And it, I'm just such a fan of, of sports. So it's I mean, we're in a great area and our family loves getting to cheer on all these all these clubs. Chicago winning the WNBA title with uh, Candace Parker winning the title. And I, do you think pro softball can get close to that level? Athletes are limited now in Rosemont. They're two years in. Uh, I'm sure you followed that as well. There's going to be a, perhaps another pro softball league starting up with Lauren Chamberlain as commissioner. Can pro softball reach the levels of a WNBA in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think you're getting the excitement. So that part, the love for it and just figuring that formula out. That's what we've got to keep. You know, I think, you look at how successful college softball is and there's no reason not to find that next bridge over because it's, I've never seen the excitement and the fandom and it, people following softball and the TV exposure. I mean, when we walk into places, we went to a Cubs game a couple of years ago and they are replaying our NCAA game against Oklahoma. So I'm trying to, you know, get food and drinks for my table and there's, you know, Wisconsin, Oklahoma replaying as we're getting ready to go to the Cubs game and it's on every TV and, you know, there, there is an interest in the sport and people love it and, and watching it played at such a high level, you know, I, I can't wait to see it keep growing and, and we're going to do our part to keep, keep pumping them out and putting athletes out there that can fill the stands that, you know, bring people to their feet couple last things you mentioned that how you're going to start the season for those that may not be aware you're going to be in Leesburg you're starting the year back in Leesburg for the second year it's kind of <laughs> funny how that works out with last year the conference starting in in Leesburg but you're open with Kentucky NCAA tournament team you got Eastern Kentucky NCAA tournament team Virginia Tech NCAA tournament. I can keep going Missouri etc cetera, etc cetera. then you go to Clearwater as you mentioned for that big major tournament which every game televised on the ESPN family and networks where you got UCF, Notre Dame, Auburn, Clemson, UCLA, USF. You're going out west to play competition. Just talk about that schedule, especially those first couple of weeks right off the bat. You're going to learn a lot about your team. Yeah, you know, if you want to win the Big Ten, you gotta you've got to play a schedule like that. And you know, winners win. So Coach Z likes to say that all the time. She she puts it on my uh, overnight oats if, if someone gives you a, a cup and you open it up and it's got a, a little message of the day so you gotta figure out how to win and and beat the best competition and so I, I don't think anyone will be phased after playing a big 10 schedule only last year that playing tough teams was that that's what we did every day um but it's gonna be fun if you're a fan i mean that espn tournament sold out in clearwater yep. We were, we were worried our, our kids wouldn't their parents wouldn't even be able to see him play that we had to figure that out and i was like this is sports in good hands if if they're selling out tournaments and it's going to feel like we're at the world series the first two weekends Maybe it'll be super regionals in the world series is what it's going to feel like it really is and i've covered clear water obviously being close there an hour and away and it's it's been it's really is like a world series environment there with it's packed it's like the environment is just insane i think it's caught even some of the people in that tournament even off guard at how big that's become and it's right up there now with like Mary Nutter, which obviously used to, you know, obviously is still a marquee tournament. And even this new tournament you're going to be a part of, I think is certainly have high hopes there as well to help schools in the Midwest and even the Northeast play softball in February, you know, because obviously the weather up there is uh, not the, the most ideal at times. Have you been someone that you think the sport should move their schedule back to help the Midwest and Northeast? Are you okay with the way the schedule is now? You know, we'll, we'll deal with how it is, but it would help, you know, if we had a week or two, it certainly would help then you, the, the travel, the amount of money we spend, how much we're on the road, those things are hard, but you know, you're going to wind up being on the road for world series anyway. So you might as well become a good road team and, and figure it out early. So that, that would help. Um, but you know, we, uh, this being able to play at, at venues like this, what a neat thing that they're putting us together. You know, these, they're putting together these powerhouse tournaments. My only worry is I joke with my team, the, the most expensive tournaments or the most, uh, they always, you know, they'll, they'll just surprise me and, and ball out and, and play tremendous under these conditions. And then you got to keep scheduling it. You got to keep going there that Mary Nutter, the first time we walked in there, that blew my mind. But then we walked away with a couple great ranked wins and, you know, you come home with a win against Auburn or you, you know, pull off a, a win against Oklahoma. And I, 
So I will see. I, I'm curious to see what this group is going to do in, in Clearwater because, you know, we're it's a beautiful tournament, but I, I just think they're going to come out and surprise me and keep making it hard that I got to book these tournaments all the time. Hey, it gets players maybe extra motivated, right? Get Work extra time in the weights or in practice. They they, they like, wow, we got to be ready to go because that's the, that's the marquee events there. And like, that gets you fired up. I would, I'd be fired up if I was a player with that schedule right off the bat. I know they, they are fired up, staying on the beach, playing against that sketch. I mean, they, they're not going to want to come home, but uh, no, it'll, it'll be great. <laughs> We're, ex- we're excited to go represent the Big Ten. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an offshoot of that ACC Big Ten challenge. Yeah. And so I think we're definitely playing for something bigger than ourselves at that tournament as well. Big offseason storyline, the instant replay will be in, in, in the postseason. It'll be on, in, you know, select conferences and schools using it across the country. How does that affect you and how does that affect the Big Ten? Well, we're working on it. You know, it'll be new. So it's a new tool and we've got to get versed up on it. And, you know, we're, we're sure we're going to make some mistakes. So the learning curve will be there, but I'm excited. You know, you watched it on TV and you watched it in the SEC tournament and it was fun to see. And I think the fans are expecting those high level calls. And so I'm sure it won't be perfect right away, but it, it worked great for volleyball, you know, getting to see that. And it's a little different pace of the game, but, uh, you know, we'll manage it. I love just to see that everything moving forward. Is that something that'll be used in the Big Ten, either in the regular season or in the conference tournament? They're working through all of it. So it's an option and every every institution's working through trying to see if we can make it happen. It's a little tougher on our field right now. We've got snow to test it out, but uh, (laughs) we'll see, Eric. We'll see. We'll see if we can make it happen. All right. I won't mention the weather that we got here in Florida right now, because then now that <laughs> get, you know, it is cold here, though. I can tell you it's still there is a cold front, you know, 60 people are flipping out in Florida. So uh, last last thing, what's going to be the keys for this group uh, internally as you get going in the season? Where is a couple of the keys for your team to have the success and the internal goals you have? Well, you know, I, I think coming off of, of being so young um, and not playing full years the last two years, find, finding a way to win. I think there's some really good talent, but we'll see early on, you know, putting it together and being creative and winning a couple different ways will be big. And, uh, you know, getting some support pitching wise, um, you know, really establishing a number two is going to be a big deal for us. Um, But offensively, we've got a lot of new faces. And so I don't think they've felt that synergy yet where one good hitter behind another, you know, really. And if we see that, I think it's going to explode. So offensively, I'm kind of excited to see that come together a little bit that we've got some speed and and athleticism, but we've got some power. If we can stack a couple strong kids together, I think that the engine's going to go. Well, we're excited to see your team soon on the field. Uh, It's going to be exciting, Coach. I know it's a busy time as you get your team ready, but thank you for taking the time for uh, talking to us uh, during this busy time. And uh, always appreciate talking to you and talking softball and and, and the big picture in the game. And uh, always appreciate talking to you, and uh, we'll talk uh, down the road. Thank you. Thanks for what you do. Thanks for highlighting our sport. We appreciate it.